my name is uh, Dr. Ian Costello. I'm here in Dublin City University. And the first thing I'm going to say is, I guess we, we have a lot of people filtering in, so I'll just actually uh, get us going and get us started. Uh, but first, for people who are new as well, I'd just like you to welcome you on behalf of Eden and uh, Eden Digital Learning Europe, which is one of Ireland's, uh, Europe's premier bodies for professional practice in uh, distance, online and e-learning. It is a very um, august network, which has been going for over 30 years. It's coming up on the anniversary of, the, of Eden this year. We're having a annual conference soon, which I will talk about in a minute. And we're part, this is part of the network of academic uh, practice uh, a huge uh, professional learning community that's run in Eden that runs a huge number of webinars. Eden has a very well respected journal, Erodal. It is involved in a huge number of research projects and uh, has 14,000 subscribers. It is at the heart of everything that's good in European uh, e learning, I, I should say. Um, one very important thing about Eden is they had a very successful conference in Tallinn next year, and this year it will be in Dublin City University. And my good colleagues, Professor Mark Brown and Dr. Orna Farrell, are the chairs of this conference. They're mm. in very capable hands. It's going to be great. I'm literally on the campus where you're going to be, and we're really looking forward to hosting you here. It should be a brilliant uh, gathering of people that we can share, practice, and disseminate your work and get together as a group of professionals um, in a professional scholarly, but also convivial atmosphere of Dublin City. Um, so in, uh, in Dublin City, I had the pleasure of meeting um, our first guest speaker here today, who I'm going to introduce in a minute. I just, in reverse order, however, I'd also like to welcome our panel. Professor Sharon O'Brien from DCU, um, Dr. Keith Quill from uh, Technological University of Dublin, and Professor Denise Whitelock from the Open University. I'll give them a more fulsome introduction when we get to our panel after our main speaker, because we're going to talk a bit about, you may have heard of something called ChatGTP, uh, and we don't have a, a, an AI to talk about ChatGTP. We have a real human being, I know, because I've met him a very lovely person, but also a very esteemed scholar, um, Professor Mike Sharples, who is Emeritus Professor from the Open University. He has a very uh, distinguished career. He was the founder of the Innovative Pedagogy Series from the Open University, you may be familiar with. <clears throat> He's written over 300 books and papers. He is um, involved in a lot of interesting things, mobile learning, uh, citizen science and has contributed massively over the course of a, a great career. Uh, but he's also written a very interesting uh, recent book uh, called Automated Essay, Essay Writing. No, sorry, that's actually his recent editorial in the Journal of uh, Artificial Intelligence. He's also the editor of that journal. Uh, this is one called Story Machines. So we, I'm going to, without further ado, hand you over to uh, Mike, to Professor Sharple, to so tell us a bit about um, automated essay writing and to get the conversation started. Please. Mm, okay. Th well, thank you, Raymond. Thank you for the introduction. Um, before we do anything, let me see if I can share my screen. Um, so can you tell me whether you can see that screen? Yes, we can. Okay, good. Good, we're getting there. Um, yes, so my name's Mike Sharples. I'm Emeritus Professor at the Open University, um, and which means that I've officially retired, but it doesn't feel like that. Um, I was starting to enjoy a retirement until something hit the headlines called um, GPT-3 and then chat GPT which happened to coincide with a book that I've been meaning to write for a long time with a colleague, um, Rafael Perez de Perez, um, on uh, automated story writing. Um, the book is called Story Machines, How Computers Have Become Creative Writers. And so by a happy coincidence, or by an interesting coincidence, um, it just happened to come out just as this software hit the headlines. So that's why I'm talking to you now. Um, 
So, as all of you will know, there has been both hype and panic uh, in recent days and weeks over students using new technology to cheat on their exams. And this is just one article um, from The Guardian on the 19th of January, 2023. Um, with the title Australian Universities to Return to Pen and Paper Exams After Students Caught Using AI to Write Essays. And the article says Australian universities have been forced to change the way they run exams and other assessments amid fears students are using emerging artificial intelligence software to write their essays. So it's all pretty scary for education uh, and it all seems a very new and um, extremely worrying about how it, this new technology is going to disrupt education. So I just wanted to put it in a little bit of historic context, um, given that I've been writing about this for the Story Machines book. So here is another article from the same newspaper, then called the Manchester Guardian, written in 1845 about hype and panic over students using new technology to cheat on their exams. In 1845, it was a machine that was being exhibited in London called the Eureka that could generate Latin verses. Uh, every pull uh, of a chord, um, this machine, the clockwork word, and uh, it could generate up to 26 million different um, hexameter Latin verses. And the Manchester Guardian, among other newspapers, uh, wrote an article um, saying, it is a machine for making Latin verses. The results are so startling that they seem to be brought about by supernatural means. And again, uh, as in today, it hit the headlines. Punch magazine wrote a spoof article saying that notable invention, the Eureka or Latin verse grinder, was tried yesterday before a committee of young gentlemen from the public schools who are anxious to have their Latin exercises done with the least possible trouble. So what goes around comes around. Um, and I think it's important. You know, just to put this in some kind of context that you know, it may seem very new and scary um, to have a machine that can perform um, essays or um, you know, write text, but there is a long and honorable history of um, technology that can generate language. <clears throat> and ChatGPT is only the most recent one of these, and it certainly won't be the last of them. So that's what I wanted to start by doing, just giving you a little bit of context. I'd like you to just take a minute to have a look at this essay, um, this undergraduate essay uh, on the topic of learning styles. And I hope, um, since you come from Eden Digital Learning Network, that you will have some familiarity with learning styles. Um, so this essay on a critique of learning styles, I'll just give you a, a couple of minutes to read it. And what I'd like you to do is to think, if a student submitted this to you, how would you assess it? What mark would you give it? Uh, and what comments would you give back to the student? Just take a look at it. Well, as you probably guessed, this, that student essay was entirely generated by an AI program, Chat GPT-3, from OpenAI, a company um, that was set up in, I think it's 2008, um, by a consortium that included Elon Musk. And Chat GPT-3, in essence, is a large language model. It's a universal language generator. Uh, so there'd been machines before that could generate language on a specific topic, 
but this can generate in any style and on any topic. It can generate not only student essays, uh, it can ge generate blogs, it can generate news items, it can translate languages. Uh, so it's a general purpose language machine. And it takes uh, as input uh, a prompt from a human user written in English language. So I simply said, write a high quality essay with academic references and evidence from research studies that critiques learning styles. And then I gave it the opening of a sentence. The construct of learning styles is problematic because, and then I pressed the submit button and it wrote the rest itself, including the paragraphs, the references in neat APA format. So that's GPT-3. Chat GPT is uh, an offshoot of GPT-3. It's a conversational agent that can hold a conversation with you, but not just a simple you know, question and answer. It can engage in quite a detailed, in-depth conversation. And just up on the screen there um, is an example of that sort of conversation. Uh, so I asked Chat GPT-3, um, should the use of um, generative AI be considered to be plagiarism? And you can see that it produced quite a lengthy response uh, and quite a plausible response, um, saying it's important to clearly indicate when text has been generated by a language model and to give credit to the source of the information. And so then I responded to chat GPT, how would I know the source of information since it's been trained on millions of texts? Now notice in my response, um, I was referring back to the previous context. I didn't need to you know, re-express it in full. Um, I, you know, I use the pronoun it, for example, has been trained on millions of texts and it understands that context. And then again, comes back with a plausible response. So you could have a conversation, quite a detailed uh, and in-depth conversation with ChatGPT. So that's the background. The next thing to say is that students are already using GPT-3 and ChatGPT for their exams. Understandably, there have been very few studies recently, but um, one that has been done is a survey of over 4,000 students from Stanford University. Um, uh, about, um, about a month ago now, that showed a quarter of those students reported using um, chat GPT for their final assignments. And you can be pretty sure that you know, if that was a month ago, there'd be plenty more that are using it now. So students are already using this technology. And in a sense, AI is democratizing cheating that before, if you wanted to cheat on your exams, you had to pay an essay mail or pay another person a large amount of money um, to write your essay for it. Now you can get it done for free with AI. So uh, it's not surprising that students are using it. That is not to say that students all want to cheat in their exams, but students are human beings and students are intelligent human beings. And there is a you know, fear of missing out. If everybody else is going to use that technology for their exams, then they don't want to miss out by getting a lower mark or um, by failing in their exams when everybody else is using the technology. Just as they have used previous technologies such as spell and style checkers. Now let's go back to that um, essay that I generated. And a few things to note about it. Firstly, the grammar and the spelling are flawless, um, that it's you know, better than a student would um, write. And you know, arguably that's one way to check whether a student has written it because you know, it produces flawless grammar and spelling. There's a structure to it. There's introduction, headings, paragraphs. It gives examples. Uh, it cites research studies. There's a progression. There are citations of um, published research, there's a conclusion, and there's a set of references at the end, all entirely generated by um, GPT-3. But let's look at it in a little more depth. 
So <clears throat> I've highlighted in bold, um, right in the middle of it, for example, a meta-analysis by Pasler et al. found no clear evidence that learning style interventions led to improved learning outcomes. And a further meta-analysis by Krieger et al. found no reliable link between learning style preferences and performance. Well, I looked for those references, and the one that's highlighted in bold is entirely fabricated. It's made up by the machine. And um, then to provide a reference to it at the end, it generated an entirely fake academic paper. There is a journal education research review, but there is no paper from Kiga, Lomax and Ross in that. It is a fake reference. <clears throat> so why does that happen? It's been called hallucination, that generative AI hallucinates. And the reason is that it's a language machine. It's not a database or a reasoning system. And this is a, you know, a misunderstanding that uh, we really need to correct, that is not looking up a database. It's not going to check its facts. It has been trained on millions of pieces of text, and it then copies the style of that. Uh, on a particular topic. So it was trained uh, up to 2021. So the first thing is it can't access current information, but at heart, it has no explicit model of how the world works. It doesn't know, um, it doesn't know how uh, machines function. It doesn't know how society functions. Um, it doesn't have a model of what should be in an academic paper and that you shouldn't make up facts. It's essentially, in human terms, amoral. And when you know, we're working with this technology, we really need to you know, recognize the fact that it is a language generator. It's not a database. And to their credit, the OpenAI company have made that quite clear from the start. Um, so here's part of a blog from the OpenAI company, despite making significant progress, our Instruct GPT models are far from fully aligned or fully safe. They still generate toxic or biased outputs, make up facts, and generate sexual and violent contact content without explicit prompting. So the company recognizes that you know, in terms of uh, providing a safe and secure system, uh, and one that generates accurate facts, their machines are still limited and wanting. So what do you do with it? You know, given that it does fabricate facts uh, and yet it produces very plausible um, text. Well, firstly, plagiarism detectors don't work. But that's because the text is generated and not copied. And you can see on the right-hand side, I put that same text through the top, a plagiarism detector, plagiarismdetector.net, and it showed 90% um, unique text. Uh, the only uh, ones that it showed as being copied were the references at the end. Secondly, there are now companies that are producing AI programs that claim to detect whether um, the text has been generated by GPT or something similar. OpenAI itself has produced uh, <clears throat> what they call a classifier, a detector. Um, and I put that same text through it. And you can see down there at the bottom left, the classifier considers the text to be unlikely AI detected. So it didn't, it, its own text, it didn't detect as being produced by AI. And in general, its tool labels 9% of human written texts as written by AI. So one in 10, it misclassifies. One in 10 genuinely human written text, it misclassifies as written by AI. So, and the reason OpenAI put its classifier out there is to make exactly that point, which is that um, detectors are still unreliable. Now, just a couple of days ago, the Turnitin company has announced a new AI detector, which it claims to be uh, more accurate 
uh, it claims that there is less than one in 10 false positives. In other words, less than if there are 100 genuine student essays um, submitted, one of them would be incorrectly classified as being written by AI. However, the company hasn't released the data underlying that. It hasn't said how its detector was trained. Um, and I would say that it's different to a plagiarism detector. A plagiarism detector will tell you the source of the text being plagiarized. It will put a reference or a pointer back to that text that's been plagiarized. AI detectors work in a different way. They look at statistical probabilities. And so it's really important to have independent verification of uh, any company or any um, AI detector that claims to be accurate. So I would expect a company like Turnitin to have independent verification of the accuracy of their technology. But in a sense, this is um, all missing the point. Because generative AI can be an empowering and joyful tool for creativity. And just looking at it as something to be in, uh, something to be detected, something to be avoided is missing the point about it being a positive and constructive tool. And yep. again, I've had fun using it. And you can see on the right hand side there, you know, a couple of queries that I gave explaining uh, explain string theory to an 11 year old child. Write an outline plot for a novel about a man and a woman who discover true happiness by living together as fantasy characters. And for both of these, it's done a pretty good job. Um, you know, I couldn't do a better explanation of string theory for an 11 year old child or an outline plot for a novel. Um, I couldn't do better than um, chat GPT for doing either of those. So it's a, it's a tool for creativity. And so I think we need to look at the other side of the coin, which is that how can we use it constructively in education? And here are some possibilities, and I hope that this is going to spark off the discussion in a few minutes. Firstly, an educator or a student can use AI to generate multiple responses to an open question. So to set an open question to the students, and then each student synthesizes and critiques the AI responses and produces their own written answer. So you use AI to generate some draft essays, which the students then critique and then uh, expand. Or secondly, an educator sets a project for students and then each student goes away and uses generative AI as a tool for research. And then the student writes a project report along with a reflective document indicating what contribution AI has made. So you're using AI as a research tool. A third possibility, and the one that I particularly like, is students engage with chat GPT as a conversational agent. So you have a Socratic dialogue, you have a dialogue with the system where you are asking it to be a respondent in an argument. Um, so here on the right hand side is an example that I tried myself. So discuss the assertion that the Chinese economic model will in the medium to long term be more successful than the US model because the government can keep a tighter control over economic, financial and social policy for the well-being of its citizens. So I get a, quite a complex you know, academic topic to chat GPT and it came back with you know, a reasonable response um, saying uh, critics argue that the lack of transparency and accountability in the Chinese system can lead to corruption, unequal distribution of wealth and unsustainable growth. So then I responded back to that. But the US also has corruption and unequal distribution of wealth. So can we discount those factors? And it came back then with you know, an amplification of its response. And we had a constructive dialogue. And what I'm suggesting is that um, students, can, either individually or in a group, can use ChatGPT as a respondent to create an argumentative essay or um, to 
create an expanded version of their thoughts or their ideas. These are just three suggestions of the way in which um, AI, generative AI, can be a tool now for academic learning. So what I want to suggest is that we should use generative AI with care, that we need to rethink written assessments. Um, do we need to go back to face-to-face, um, -face, uh, invigilated exams, if we want students, for example, to demonstrate their ability to write um, clear, um, well-structured uh, and well-spelled and grammatically correct assignments? Are we willing now to let AI become a tool for um, supporting student writing? We should explore AI for creativity, argumentation and research. We certainly need to develop a new AI literacy, just as we developed a digital literacy. And we need to introduce and negotiate guidelines for students and staff. So I'm just going to leave you with some guidelines um, that, uh, of course, I use GPT to generate. I did that deliberately um, because, firstly, I didn't want them just to come from me. And second, I'm putting them up there um, in order to be critiqued. Um, I have put them uh, on a, uh, a Twitter posting and got lots of interesting responses back. In general, that they look plausible, but items five and six, um, we need to consider with care. And lastly, what next? Um, so, GPT isn't going to be the end. There are going to be more things coming along. There will be AI generated video blogs and courses. There will be topical generative AI because as I said, GPT um, really cuts off in 2021, but there will be new hybrid systems that can combine topical access to a database with generative AI. There will be common sense generative AI that reasons about the world and there'll be interactive story worlds um, where you can um, become a character in an AI generated story. Um, do we have time just to give one quick video? Uh, I because I think I, mean, I would like to do this, just, it's just two minutes uh, and I think it shows, gives you an idea of what's going to come. Um, I think I might have to put on, um, if you just hold a minute, I'll stop the sharing because I need to let me share again. Because I need to say share sound and share. And I'm just going to share. I'm just going to play this video for you quickly. Hey, this is Chris from Wistia, and today on my lunch break, I'm going to make a video using nothing but generative AI. First, I need a script. I'll open up ChatGPT and prompt it with this. Write a script in the style of a YouTube video about how to make an apple pie. The video should be under 60 seconds long. The script should feel friendly in nature. I've been writing video scripts for over 20 years, and this thing just spit out a script in seconds, and it's actually pretty damn good. I'm blown away. So I'm going to go ahead and copy this masterpiece, and I'll open up Synthesia. I'll create a new video and choose my own custom AI avatar that I've made. I'm going to upload a background image for the video, and I'll move my avatar over to the side of the frame. And I'll make avatar me just a bit smaller. In Synthesia, along with my custom avatar, I also have a custom voice print, which will basically turn text into my own voice. Scary? Yeah, I bet, but let's hope this doesn't fall into the wrong hands. Anyway, now all I have to do is copy the script that was generated by ChatGPT and head up to click Generate. This will take a few minutes, so I'll, I'll go ahead and grab some water. Okay, my avatar is ready. So let's take a peek at a quick sample. Hey there, 
In this short video, I'm going to show you how to make a delicious apple pie. Okay, this is not great. And it's quite disturbing to me personally. I mean, I see me and hear me, but it's not me. It actually kind of makes my skin crawl, to be honest. But I think I can guzzy this video up with some B-roll to take the emphasis off of AI avatar me. So I'll download the video and open up Descript. I'll upload my video and the software will automatically transcribe my video back into text. Transcribing. Now I can highlight the moments of my video that I want to visualize. Like this line, how to make a delicious apple pie. I'll head into their footage tab and type in apple pie and select the clip. This one works well. I'll do that for some other lines in the video and choose some nice looking stock footage clips. When I'm done, I'll hit export, which will take a couple minutes. All right, here is my new AI generated video about how to make a great apple pie. As a video producer of over 20 years, does this put me out of a job? Don't you be extinct. Let's roll the video to find out. Hey there. In this short video, I'm going to show you how to make a delicious apple pie. First, preheat your oven to 375 degrees. Next, roll out your pie crust and place it in a pie dish. In a separate bowl, mix together sliced apples, sugar, cinnamon, and a pinch of salt. Pour the mixture into the pie dish, making sure to evenly distribute the apples. Cover the pie with a second pie crust and use a fork to press the edges together and create a decorative border. Use a knife to make a few slits in the top of the pie crust to allow steam to escape. Date the pie for 45 minutes or until the crust is golden brown. And that's it. Your apple pie is ready to be enjoyed. Thanks for watching and happy baking. Now, I'm not trying to say that these AI tools will totally replace human creativity and storytelling. And as you can see, the tech does have some room for improvement. I'm going to show you how to make a delicious apple pie. Apple pie. Apple pie. But this stuff can be used today to help bring your vision to life. So what do you think? Is this the future of content creation? Or will it be a dystopian reality to the likes of which we've never seen? So that's an example of what's coming. And you know, it took him 15 minutes to create that video. Um, but in the future, you'll just be able to press the button and it'll do all of that for you. So you know, it's not just assessment that's going to be automated. It's also going to be content creation. So that's that's what's coming. And let me know what you think. Finally, if you do want to find out more, that's the, the book that we produced, um, Story Machines, How Computers Have Become Creative Writers. And um, I'll now hand you back to Eamon and to the, to the discussion. Uh, thank you very much, Mike. I almost I'm, I almost don't want to thank you because I was so scary. I don't know if thanks is the right word, right? <laughs> That's absolutely terrifying. Just when we thought we could use videos for assessments, that's no good either. Um, but um, on, a, on a, just thank you deeply more seriously. That was absolutely fascinating and, and riveting and I'm gonna get our panel's input on it. I just like, also like to ask as well, if there's any uh, students online, I see one of my students at least here uh, coming along. We'd love to get a, a question from students have their voice at this because this is an important uh, principle. So please, um, Feel free to ask a, a, a question in the chat if you're a student, and I'll try and put it to our panel. Uh, and it was very interesting about what you said there about uh, that new development from Turnitin. Uh, their claims about their detection, which I read with a lot of interest yesterday when I saw that coming out. Uh, we, myself and my students this year were looking at a pay, paper, The State of the Art and Practice in AI and Education. It's one of our NIDL top reads by Holmes, uh, Wayne Holmes and Ika Toomey. And they did a great survey of AI and education research. And one of the things they point to is the lack of evidence on what actually works and so on. But the, the problem is a lot of the research is being done by very, very big companies and they have all this data, they're doing the research and it's not that they're obviously hugely conflicted, you know, they've, they're selling us the stuff. Uh, but there's also really good researchers out there doing research who are independent, who are not in these companies. And that's a, a segue for me to say uh, from my friend, 
uh, uh, in Oxford and Professor Denise Whitelock was there and she had a wonderful paper on AI and essays. She won the best paper award that year. So she, I'm going to uh, hand over to our, our first panelist now and ask her to comment. Uh, she is a professor of technology enhanced assessment and learning and director of Open University's Institute of Educational Technology. And she's also the vice president of uh, research at Eden and a very uh, distinguished and story career. But I'd just like to ask you um, if you would get us going, Professor Whitelock, and um, maybe I'll put to you, you can either just make a, a comment on, on Mike's uh, talk on some aspect that you think is, is worth noting or commenting, or if you think there is some, because you have done a lot of research as well into supporting automated feedback of, of essays, for example. And so I think you, you'd be a very good place person. So I'm going to ask you about what are the opportunities of these, this, this type of technology? Oh, you're just on mute. Eamon, I'd rather start with a threat, if I may, because I think the presentation is scary, but I'd like to start off by saying, you know, what we saw and Mark's presentation, um, Mike's presentation was excellent, is that we ought to know this is built on the back of earlier work, years and years of work, with big data, cheap computational power, and a large investment, as we can see from these companies. However, in my own experience, you know, a lot of big data prep must go on before you can actually use it in this way. And Mike mentioned that, you know, the data, what we were using, the database there was from 21, I believe he says. So it's time consuming to make the data model ready. And um, if data is changing fast, which it is, it needs a lot of prep. So I think, we should understand what's going on behind the scenes as well. And this becomes much more difficult for us as researchers with not lots of money as well and access to different areas. But that doesn't mean to say that as independent researchers, we haven't got a voice here and can put some input. But the threat that I'm really concerned about is trust. Now, I picked up that there, um, I saw ChatGPT had actually authored or was a co-author on some medical <laughs> articles. Now, my question to everyone is, would you trust, you know, ChatGPT with a legal matter or with a medical matter? And, um, you know, years ago, Mike will know as well, in AI, you know, people were enamored with Eliza. You know, it could, uh, it had a model and it, you could uh, talk to it as a psychologist. It was very simple at the time, but very groundbreaking. People were enamored with it. So, you know, the threat is, are people gonna become enamored with this? So I think we need to recognize that we need to support people in this, in use of these tools. And as I think the most disturbing thing for me was the video, <laughs> because, but it made me think, okay, well, and Mike's right, because he knows all about creativity, been working in this area for a long time. Do I need any authors? I don't need you, Mike, to write any books. I can get it myself. I can write my own book, find my own book, or even for entertainment. Do I need to go to my favorite authors? And if videos are coming along and there's a lot going on in this area in China, and creating videos, et cetera, very extensive work, um, do I need entertainment companies anymore? Or do we, is the new business ourselves creating that we share with our friends? So I think there are a lot of threats out there, but um, very interesting, more philosophical perhaps questions 
than educational ones. But I think the threat to education maybe is lethargic cognition, you know, following by rote, not understanding. Um, I can't do anything if it hasn't got the assistance of one of these uh, areas. But I think I'll stop there. But it was very good to listen to what you said, Mike, and I'm sure it sparked many ideas from lots of the panel and others. Thank you so much, Denise, and that's a, a marvelous phrase, lethargic uh, cognition. Um, uh, I would like to, uh, my, my good colleague here in another part of the campus as well, uh, Professor Sharon O'Brien from Dublin City University, a professor of translation studies, and she has expertise in interdisciplinary areas of translation, AI and HCI. And I'd like to ask you, uh, Professor O'Brien, if you would, um, Give us a, a comment, please, on, on either a threat or an opportunity. Yeah, thank you very much, Eamon. Um, I might also start with the threats. Um, and of course, there are very many that you could choose from. Um, just to give a little bit of context, I'm coming at this from the point of view of somebody who has done work uh, in research in machine translation for, for many decades, which is, of course, um, a type of AI. And we've been facing threats of machine translation, both in academia and in the translation profession since around the 1940s. Um, so uh, for, for many decades, we could ignore those threats because the technology just wasn't good enough. But it's really from, I suppose, around the mid 1990s with um, statistical approaches and data driven machine learning approaches that we've seen um, the threats really come to the fore and people have started to, to become worried. And of course, it's something that's used day to day by professional translators now. And ChatGPT has just shaken the bushes even more, I guess. Um, so um, in terms of threats, so, and, and looking at it, especially from the point of view of um, uh, machine translation as a form of AI, I think um, one of the biggest things is that we've seen such an acceleration in the development of the mm -hmm. technology in the last number of years. Um, it, it develops so quickly that um, our reactions are always going to be behind the curve, um, whether we're educators or working in the profession. So um, that, is, that is quite a challenge for us, I think. Um, the technology developers like to develop uh, the next best thing, the most exciting thing, the thing that's going to create um, the headlines and so on, what the implications are very often they don't care about. And we as academics or as educators are always running to catch up. So that, that is a major, major threat. I think we'll always be running to catch up if it keeps going uh, at the speed that it's going at. And um, linked to that, I suppose, one of the major threats that we've seen over the years um, is the media hype. So the media get on the story and very often they will publish maybe a page as and basically without much understanding of the technology or the area that they're commenting on will declare for example in our case that the profession of translation is dead <laughs> uh, nobody needs to learn a foreign language anymore um, and of course these messages are taken up by young people making career decisions by their parents who are guiding them in terms of career decisions and um, just focusing on that particular area, you know, if everybody stopped learning a foreign language because we could just use chat GPT, we know there would be serious consequences globally. Um, so, um, so I think that those are some of the threats that I would highlight uh, just, you know, looking at it from a particular um, um, area in terms of translation. So I'll hand back over to you, Eamon, now. That's wonderful, Sharon. Thank you so much. And that's obviously the the media uh, panic about nothing. And as you say, it's it's going to be it's 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 a worry for parents of what what should people be studying in the future. What are the key skills if, if AIs are going to do these things? Um, and someone who is, I'm going to uh, ask our, our, our next, our 
Uh, next panelist, uh, Dr. Keith Cool from Technological University, Dublin, who's done a lot of great work in, in Ireland and abroad and uh, internationally on computer science education, but is also um, an expert to the European Commission Group on AI and data in education and training. And they had a wonderful report about um, ethics and AI for, for teachers um, so on recently. But um, I'd just like to ask you, uh, Dr. Quill, if you would like to um, join, please join the conversation here at this stage and um, tell us, give us a thought. Thank you. Um, I, I'd love to be super optimistic. So I'm going to start off with the positives um, because often we, we we kind of focus on the threats and there is threats, of course. The, the first positive is that, well, before I was a lecturer, I was actually a, a teacher in a disadvantaged school. And I see huge benefits to the use of tools like this for differentiation in classroom, for students with special educational needs. There's huge positives for the use of this tool on the ground pretty quickly, um, as, as well as for like if you're, you know, if you're even in third level generating assignments and whatever subject or task, you can then generate multiple tasks. You can you can assign a much wider variety of learning for students with, with these tools, of course. Um, and I'm still going to be optimistic, even though I'm going to talk about threats. So while we do see these large language models, and I'm going to pick up on what Denise and Sharon said, that they're they're huge models, they're they're fallible, they they make mistakes. But there's a huge movement happening also about getting away from complexity models like GPT-3 you know, is 80,000 euros in two weeks to learn on a supercomputer it has serious effects, not just for, it, it has serious greenhouse effects or green effects for training. These models, while they're fantastic, there, there's a whole push now to move back to more traditional explainable models. And that was the whole ethos of the, the EU work was building this trustworthiness. How can you identify a model with hundreds of million parameters? I think GPT-4 is heading towards a billion parameters or something like this. These are impossible to identify how these decisions or outputs are made. One of my favorite papers, if you've ever written it, is in nature, uh, ever re read it, is a paper by Cynthia Rudin um, in the States who says, stop using black box models and let's start moving towards more transparent AI. So and this was a big thing. Like, how can a teacher use a tool if we're unsure if the results are going to be real or, or unreal or how are they generating them? What biases exist? If you ask a certain question a certain way, will you get a different answer towards someone else? So I think while the tools are fantastic at what they do, um, there is a movement, a positive movement happening simultaneously around human-centered AI and trustworthiness. And while it's not there yet, and obviously the really interesting, fast, amazing tools are, are keeping up, but I do see I do see possibilities. And the final point I'll make is that we, as a scientific community, even like in, in all areas of research, not just computing, have started already to start examining the process rather than the black box outcome, which is the essay at the end, right? So if you take literature reviews now, there's been a huge movement towards systematic literature reviews, which in essence, at the minute, and I think there's, it is a moving target, chat t cannot search live databases. Now I'm saying at the minute, it's, it is a moving target. So things like systematic literature reviews ensure that the process is, is a sort of assessed more than just here's your literature review at the end of your paper. And I'm not sure who generated or how it was generated or if there was human bias or machine bias. So I think I think education will, will migrate a little bit towards looking at the process and whether that's, I saw loads of comments in there about interviews or vivas and you know, if there are videos, who knows what they'll be in time. But there's definitely, we're, we're, I think we'll move towards looking at the processes of learning rather than the end product or the black box of learning. Sorry for keeping it in machine learning talk, just for a bit of fun. Um, so yeah, I'm going to try to be optimistic as much as I possibly can. But also I am biased because I am an AI practitioner. I teach AI, I teach on the, the human-centered masters. So it is something that we teach a lot in. But I, I do see positivities and I see changes happening. They may not keep up, but there's my uh, my two cents if that helps at all. Thank you very much, uh, Keith. And I think that's... Um... You mentioned a couple of things there. You mentioned trust as well, which which Denise had kind of started off on about this, and, and it was in Sharon's response to create that offer out there to everyone, um, uh, to particularly if they're students, please uh, ask a question to our panel because we still have a few minutes. And I saw it's impossible to keep up with the chat. I need an AI for this, but uh, Eugene had an interesting one as well about the uh, continuation of does anyone know of a reliable source proving that chat GPT makes use of data till 2021. And this is, I guess, all this black box thing. It's we're relying on what it's outputting to us and we're trying to it's a moving target, but um, um, I guess that's something as well about this centralized, we have this centralized, this one massive, I think somebody said at the start, it, it might have been yourself or, or, or uh, Mike or Keith, that it's, we're up to a billion, a billion users now of, of the, of the uh, service. So um, 
I'd like to ask uh, all our panel and anyone uh, or Mike is what do you think of this? If we have this threat of some uh, becoming over reliance on one big uh, service or provider, do you have any thoughts on that? I'll put that out to all of you. Um, I, I while everybody's looking, I saw a post by a, I'm not sure if people are familiar with Jan Lachan, one of the sort of co-founders of, of AI, and these models are everywhere. It's not just ChatGTP. I mean, Facebook, Google use them in their current search. They just don't output in the same way that ChatGTP has seemed to hit a spot. So I think while we say there's one model, there's hundreds or thousands of these around the world using many different contexts. So I think it's hard to point out if one is better or worse, or if one is. I mean, they'll all be fallible. They'll all make mistakes. But there's, I, I would just like to say that there's there's not just one. Just because this one hit the popular media, there is thousands of these models used in daily basis on multiple things. Sorry, I didn't mean to overcut. I think Mike wants to talk as well. No, no I mean I, I agree. There isn't just one, and we, you know, what tends to happen when a new technology comes along is that the the press focus on a particular instance, and in this case, Chat GPT, um, which, um, but there are many different models for different purposes. Uh, they're being trained in different ways. Um, so, you know, what we don't know is that in China there is um, also you know, a a model that's being used. Um, that is going to be then added to Baidu, the Chinese search engine. Um, so you know, there's work being going on in other countries. It's not just US corporations that are developing these. There are also some open consortia as well um, that are developing similar sorts of models. Um, and so there is varying degrees of openness. You know, in the most open one, you have the, uh, the data that it's been trained on, um, the source code. In the more closed ones, all you get is the opportunity to interact with the system itself, but no understanding of how it was trained. But uh, as Keith said, um, one of the inherent features of these models is that we don't understand the internal processes. Um, in a sense, we don't understand the internal processes of, of humans either. We don't get, know what goes on inside our brains. But what humans can do is explain their reasoning. Uh, and it was, it's possible to ask ChatGPT to explain its reasoning. And if you do that, it tends to come back with a better response. But um, it's still very limited in how it can explain its reasoning. And if you're wanting it to do scientific reasoning, for example, then asking it to explain how it came up with its answer is a good way to get it get inside its 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 brain, if you like, to see how it's doing its its computation, see how it's doing its reasoning. But we're still at a very early stage of systems that can explain their reasoning. Can, can I mention something minor just from reading all the chat? Many people are referring to it as like them, it, they're giving it sort of nouns that make it sound human or are sort of more intelligent than it is. And I think we we as a community develop a lot of misconceptions about what this model is capable of, even by how we're terminating. I, I saw one poster saying they're stopping calling it AI or because of this intelligence word and so forth. I mean, we see this in, in primary and secondary schools where kids are using tools and they're now getting frustrated that the tool can't solve the problem because they believe it's intelligent because we also spread a lot of misconceptions that this 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 algorithm essentially is a uh, is far more capable than it possibly would would be. Or so I I guess it's just a point when I see all of the text and people can't even agree on what to call it in some of the text, which is or the chat, which is interesting. I think Keith's point <laughs> just made is very important. Um, when Google came along and we had search engines, you know, we could be talking on the telephone before video conferencing, and you wouldn't remember something, name or something. You could easily go up and Google be talking. No one would know you couldn't remember it. It was an add-on. And you can see how um, these tools can assist. I mean, Adept AI is another startup and it's talking about you having a teammate with you that can help you. For example, if, um, you know, you're working on an Excel spreadsheet, oh joy, as you have to do with your budgets when you're the director, um, and you want to pivot some tables and you haven't done it for a long time, something, uh, something that they could produce, Adept AI, you could just call on the um, 
piece of software and it will do it for you. It will be an adjunct. But as Mike said, it doesn't necessarily know what to do and it can't explain it. So I think on a positive front, these are tools that can help us to think better, to do different things, because we can at least rationalize and explain that. So that's the positive side of this. And um, we've got good researchers as well that can look into this and see the future as well, because we make the future, don't we, in our research. So I think it's um, maybe a call, Keith, as well, to say we should be informing journalists better. Now, Mike, when you showed us that first piece, I thought it was very journalistic in style. And I thought, I listened to the instructions you gave it. You did say put references, but you didn't say write in an academic style. And I think that style, did you? Because I thought the style was more journalistic. It talked about learning styles as well with um, physiological responses. You don't see much of that in the literature. Anyway, just, just a, a point. I'm finished, Eamon, sorry. <laughs> Amen. if I may jump in very quickly. Thank you. Thank you. Because that was, I know I that was focused, wonderful. I was going to ask you, Sharon, go ahead. Please. Yeah, yeah. No, I focused on the um, the negatives, so I would like to say some positives as well. Um, and, and just to follow up on what Denise said there, and going back to um, your, your wonderful phrase, Denise, lethargic cognition. Um, I think that one of the positives is of, the, of these, these tools and technologies is actually augmented cognition. Because we look at machines um, and in my, in my world, people tend to disparage what the machine can do and I can do better because I'm human, I'm more creative, et cetera, et cetera. But um, I think we should stop uh, thinking about it as uh, the machine versus the human, but rather, you know, how can these tools and technologies augment our own limitations? Because we have plenty of them, right? Um, so if I'm a translator, I might find chat GPT or a similar tool to be somewhat inspirational. If I'm stuck, um, you know, I might not use the solution that it gives me, but it will spark another solution that would be even better. So I think that uh, the use of the tools and teaching people how to use them to help augment our own limitations might be uh, one way of, of looking at the, the positives here. Thank, thank you so much, Sharon. And um, our time is, is almost up. So I'd just like to, um, there's a couple of points of order. People are looking for the recordings and the slides and I believe they will be available, so yes. Um, I'd just like to deeply thank uh, all our speakers, uh, Professor Sharples, Quill, O'Brien and Whitlock for the fantastic erudition and sharing their learning so well. And I think we just had a wonderful conversation. This is just the first part of the chat. We're going to stay chatting in Dublin in, in June of this year. Come to the, the Eden uh, National Conference. We'll see you all here in my beautiful office here. Uh, on the on the beautiful campus in Dublin City University, and uh, deepest thank you to our panelists for everybody who contributed, and to Eden for hosting this uh, talk. Uh, thank you all.